Uh, you are eternal. If you were going to talk to somebody about this, uh, where would you go? Well, here's a verse. Okay, now we're giving the verses out for free today, so suck them up and use them next week or the following week. In your discussions with family, <laughs> when it comes to talking about these things, uh, I had a, stand, a chance, we were on a cruise last night, we went over to uh, uh, Pasadena, went out on a Starlight Cruise. You guys just were recently on one? Yeah. So Raymond James threw a, a Starlight Cruise uh, party for the trust company, and we went over there. And so uh, I was, you know, sitting there listening to all these people talk, and then we got this table, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, uh, a guy walked up that I know, uh, Carly and I have known him for a long time, and he began to talk to me about some Bible things, and so I just preached a 15-minute sermon to him, and I turned around, the whole, the whole table was listening, okay? So that was good. Somehow along the line, I got to do that last night. I was in preaching mode for some 15 minutes or so. It wasn't really preaching mode, but he has a lot of issues about Calvinism and Arminianism, and he's so, he's so confused. And um, I, I just, it, it, it bothers me to see people that confused. And the way he talks and the way he uh, speaks, it makes you think that he's lost, that he doesn't understand. And I, I tell you, my experience is when people are confused, it's usually because they're lost, okay? And when it comes to that sort of stuff, uh, when you're talking about uh, things con concerning salvation and eternal life, if you're confused about that, you're not saved. Most people that are saved are not confused about that. That's not an issue, okay? You understand it. And so I appreciated uh, the fact that he was willing to listen to that for a little bit. So he wants to get together and talk, and he wants me to give him some materials. I said, okay, good. And so... Um, now, this might mess with uh, his church-going experience, where he is now, but that's not what life is about, is it? It's not about your church-going experience. All of you here can attest to that. Now, you have a great church-going experience here, but it is different, you have to admit. So when people come, they go, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, we're doing Bible study. What's that? <laughs> so anyway, uh, the book of Jude, look at verse 7. Now, this is a simple verse. It's not complicated. Uh, the book of Jude is talking about the last days in the tribulation period. The people reading it will be in the tribulation period when they read it. Uh, they are basically learning about the concision and that portion of Israel that has gone really off the reservation is no longer you know, these people are not with God. These are the ones that crucified Christ and so forth. It, generationally, they're not the same ones, but they are, they are part of that spiritual lie, and they've bought into this. And so this whole book, it's a very short little book, 25 verses, but it is a book that is a warning against these wicked people and these, these religious people of Israel's time. And Israel is, of course, split. It's split into two groups during the tribulation period, the ones that believe God and the ones that do not. And the ones that do not sell the other ones out, and they, they make a, a, a really like Faust. I mean, they make a pact with the devil, and it's really a terrible thing. So, you know, you know all these things that you see in history and all these things you see in, in drama and cinema, they all have their roots in the Bible. And here they are. Here are the roots. Verse 7, as, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are, notice, set forth for an example. Now, what kind of example are they? Nobody's ever seen this. You know, uh, somebody made the comment in a sermon that, uh, that when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, that Sodom and Gomorrah was still burning 500 years later, okay, that you could still see the smoke. And it's interesting. Uh, I've been trying to find out how to verify that in the Scripture. The, the, the issue is... You know, we weren't there. And we didn't empirically put our eyes on the thing. But we have the record. And, and this is what God says. He says that they are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, how do we know that the fire and brimstone with the hail coming down at Sodom and Gomorrah, destroying the cities of the plain, was going to cause those people to go where? into an eternal fire because this verse tells you that's what happened there. This is a divine commentary on what actually happened. People don't like to look at this verse and say that 
uh, because they can see some comparisons between what's going on back then and what's going on today. When you look at the State of the Union today, we, we talk about that in terms of political things and, and what they're doing in, in Washington. But what are they doing in the, in the cities? What are they doing in the countries? What, what, what is going on in the world morally right now? It, it's just the same thing. So when you see, when you talk to people about the vengeance of eternal fire, we don't walk around trying to, you know, espouse ourselves as, you know, charter members of the John Birch Society. I was talking to Scott about this today, about when, when God gets done with America, I mean, you guys are in trouble, you know. God's blessings have come off of America. We know that God isn't doing anything like that today. Our message today is not vengeance of eternal fire coming on America because America is doing this, 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 or this. The message today is grace and peace, and it is because the vengeance and the, the wrath is being withheld that we have something to be excited about. Another day of grace, that's what we have. And every day that you wake up is another day that your friends and your family and your relatives and, and the people that you know, your neighbors, they get a chance to be saved. You are eternal. That, that verse says so. Look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 while we're over here. 20 verse 12. You know this verse. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, who are these people? It says the dead. Well, if they're dead, what are they doing standing here? <laughs> Do dead people stand around? Or we thought, what happens to them? You know, the world says, well, you just, you're dead like a dog. You go nowhere. You're just like a bug. You, you step on the cockroach and it's gone. Okay, you smash the ant, boom, he's gone. No, 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 no. When you die, you're eternal. You're eternal right now. Now, you're withering on the vine, but... You're going to drop off the vine, hit the ground, they're going to dig a hole and slide you right in. That's the way it's going to work. The issue of the burial is always to get rid of the body, okay? Get rid of the body. That's what the burial is all about. And, and so you don't take the body and bury grandma under the front porch, do you? You take her way out in the field and bury her because that's what you do, okay? And, and that, that is the, 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 the picture of those of that corruption being taken away. So the dead stand before God and they must have, if, I mean, if they're standing before God and they're, they're, they're small and great, they're just the everyday working blue collar guy and, and the kings as well. When they're all standing there, what does that make them in your mind? To me, it makes them eternal. Look at verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 10. Notice when the devil gets thrown into the lake of fire. I would expect to hear a bunch of amens when you say that. <laughs> or a hallelujah, anyway. He says, that. verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet, what? Are. So where'd they get there? How'd they get there? Look over chapter 19 and look at verse 2. Wouldn't you like to have this job? This would be so much fun. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 19, I said 2. I, I'm... I'm giving you the wrong verse. Chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his, what? Image. So the beast is not the image itself. The beast is an image of this religious system, this iconic idol. That's what this is all about, is idolatry. And so what happens? And he says, that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So they were cast in alive, and then back over here in verse 10, we just looked at that they're still there when Satan is thrown in. So he throws, he throws them in and at the beginning of the millennial kingdom and then at the end of the millennial kingdom when Satan is let out, he, he takes them and he 
you know, he, he brings fire upon the judgment of his followers that have gone up against Jerusalem. And then he takes the devil and he throws him into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. What do you learn about these three creatures? They're eternal. And, and they're never going to get out. The smoke of their torment is going to rise up for eternity as a testimony against sin. And it's a terrible thing. But when you begin to understand about eternity, you've you got to personalize it. You can't just talk about eternity as a time frame. Okay? It's not about just a time frame. You're a living soul. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2. When you came into this world... You became a person with a personality, and you became your own individual person. That's you, the soul, and you are going to stay that way forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, you're going to go through some changes. Some people are born into the world, right? They become part of the human race. Some of them never make it. They try, but they're killed before they're even born. And then you have people that are, they come in and they, they die shortly after. And then some people actually grow all the way up to maturity and they die young maybe. And then some die all the way, they go, live all the way up until their old age. But eventually you're going to die. And verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit of God coming into the nostrils of man. And he and, and made him, he says, and man became a living soul. Now, the soul sleepers want to tell you that, that the soul was a formational entity because God breathed his spirit into a pile of clay. He makes the body up, he breathes into the nostrils of it, and boom, it gets up and walks around. And you say, wow, that's magic. No, that's God. That's just him doing that. But when you, when you die, that spirit goes back to God who gave it, and the soul continues on, and the body we take out and dig, and dig a home and plant next to Grandma, okay? Because we've got to get rid of that. It's just corrupted. It's gone. Some people opt to be burned up. They just like to be, you know, they want to be cremated. Well, it's okay either way, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't make any difference to me. God isn't going to resurrect your existing body. He's going to make a new body that pleases him. So when he gets done, he's going to raise you up with a new body. Now, the idea that you are eternal, turn over to Acts chapter 17, is very important. You are a living soul. Acts chapter 17. And Paul talks about this issue. And he talks to these people who are worshiping an idol. They have an altar here. They're giving devotions. And Paul says in verse 23, I found an altar with this inscription. It says, see in caps, it says, to the unknown God. Who would do that? Who would make, who would make a devotional altar? And, 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 and we say, well, we don't know who this is. We got all these other gods all named and deified and everything. So we're just going to put to the unknown God just to cover our bets. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That's paganism for you. He says, to the unknown God. Paul says, yeah, he's unknown, all right. I'm going to tell you who he is right now. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, he says, declare I unto you. That's a good way to look at Paul's life, isn't it? That was what he was to do. Paul says that he was chosen to be an apostle to reveal his son in me, he says. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything. Now, were there people living on the earth at that time that thought the temple was being lived in by God? Yes, there were. The Jews thought he was that that was still active and that that was still going on. But they were faking it. They, didn't, they knew God wasn't in there, according to the Old Testament, the way he was, the Shekinah glory wasn't in there. That none of that was really going on. And in order to show that to the world, what did he do at the crucifixion? Remember the earthquake that took place during that time, during when he was on the cross? The graves were opened, 
And, the, and everybody just laid there. They didn't get up. They didn't, they didn't get up and walk into the city until after he was raised. But you remember what else was happened? What else happened up at the temple? Think of yourself where you are. If you're on Calvary, if you're standing there on Calvary's Mount, looking at the, the, the Golgotha, the place of the skull, and you looked up on Mount Moriah, you would see the face of the Holy of Holies. That's the big box. So let's say you've got this big giant square, which has got a wall around it. It's a rectangle. And then right in uh, back... Uh, two-thirds back from the front gate, you've got this like a shoebox open standing straight up. It's a real tall kind of pillared building, and it has this giant curtain, just like the one you see here behind us, only it's a lot bigger. It's like this thick, and it's woven. That's how thick it is, but it's woven. And this thing is massive, and they would pull that thing, you know, closed. That was the, they didn't have a hard door on this. They had this curtain symbolic of the tabernacle in the wilderness where they had a curtain there. And so that thing was massive. And this was in Herod's great temple that he built. It was fantastic. And right in the middle of that crucifixion, during that process, before they took him down off the cross, that big giant veil rent. It just went rip right down the middle. Nobody tore it. It just ripped on its own, fell down, opened, uh, opened it up to show everybody he's not in there. He's not in there. He's out here. <laughs> you see? And Israel didn't see that. I'm sure they got the sew up the curtain committee together right away to try to figure out how to stop all this from getting out. But I don't think they ever pulled that off. Because just three, and a half, uh, three days later from that time, several of their ancestors came up out of those graves and began to walk around in the city. Okay? And I'm sure they were pretty preoccupied with that whole activity at the time. Okay? So you're not the only people to know about zombies and vampires, okay? They, they, they saw them and had to deal with them. So that was the way it was. Now, this whole thing, God says here, and Paul says it beautifully, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeth, seeing he giveth to all, he says, life and breath and all things. Now, that's a great verse, isn't it? He's the one that made us, and he did not make us to be snuffed out because the soul sleeper, he says that when the spirit comes together with the clay, it makes the soul, and then when the spirit leaves the body, the soul disintegrates also. That's not true. The soul is eternal. The soul lives forever, okay? The soul goes on. Look at Revelation chapter 1, or... Uh, and I'm trying to find, I can't remember where that verse is now. Um, hold on. Revelation chapter, um, yeah, I know it's not in chapter 1. Um, there was, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll have to look that up for you later. Um, it's, it's the verse where the souls are underneath the throne of God. You know, have you ever seen that where they cry out from underneath the throne and they, they want to know how long are you going to wait? I have to check that verse. The, uh, the, the issue is, I just want you to get it in your mind that they're, they're there and, and they're not dead. They have life. In the lake of fire, where are they? They're there. They're not dead. Jonathan asked us the other day, he says, well, if they're in the lake of fire, would, wouldn't, they be, wouldn't that be eternal? How could that be eternal life? He was asking. He couldn't figure out how that could be life. I said, well, it isn't life. It's eternal death. It's the second death. Death has, death has a consequence to it, just like death has a consequence for us, but it, has, it can go both directions. So when you die, what happens? You, and you're saved. You go to heaven, Okay. But when lost people die, oh, the consequence is much different. So it, it's, it's, there's this eternal aspect of it. You're made by the eternal God. Turn to Revelation 22 and, and, and understand that the reason that you are eternal is that God himself made you that way. That's the whole point. Revelation chapter 22. You're made by the eternal God. Revelation 22 
And if you, if you look at it, you see the term. It's beautiful. You, you notice in verse, uh, this is the, the new paradise it's called. This is the new Jerusalem. And notice verse uh, 4. He says, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. No night. Imagine that. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. So the sun's gone now. It's, it's not there. Don't you always think of the sun as being something that's always been around? I mean, Adam looked at the same sun you do. Your forefathers, your ancestors, they all looked at the same stars and the sun and the moon that you do. Okay? It's been there forever. The one constant thing is the sun always comes up and it always goes down. Okay? What happened on the day of the crucifixion when he was hanging there? What happened to that? God blocked it out, didn't he? He blocked it out. He made it totally dark. They didn't know what it was. That scared him to death. He says, there's no night there. That's interesting. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is the final culmination of Israel and all of the people that they have ever brought to the Lord all the Gentiles saved before the law, all the Gentiles reached out and th that got saved under the law, which were probably very few, but there were some. And then Gentiles that were saved, not in the dispensation of grace, but in the tribulation and, and Gentiles saved in the millennial kingdom. They're all going to be together in one place. And this is the New Jerusalem. And if, you'll, if you want to go back and read chapter 21, read where you get the, the, see the whole city and the measurements and so forth. It's fantastic. And so there's that forever and ever. It's eternal. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And this is how we talk about the internal witness and the external witness. The internal witness is you. With your conscience, which you get from God, and the external witness is his creation, which we get from God, and we get a chance to look at it. We can see the invisible things. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him, of him, the invisible things of him, those are things that, that come from God, that are God's, that, are, that are, we read about as God having, right? He sits on a throne, but you've never seen it. It's in a throne room, which you've never seen. Okay, there's angels there, which you've never seen. Okay, these are all things that are invisible to us because they're in a different realm. They're in a realm or a place that we can't look into. He says, for the invisible things of him, how? From the creation of the world are clearly seen. So if you look at the creation, you know God's been here. You know he's come and he set this up according to what? According to how he lives and what he does. All of you right now are sitting on thrones. Rather cheap Im imitations of thrones, but they are still thrones, are they not? There's four posts on the bottom, and there's a seat in the back. It's a chair, right? We call it a chair. But you're sitting on something that God was sitting on long before any of this was ever created. So when he comes up with the idea, does he just make it different for us? No. He does this so that he can show us his own creation. When you go into the museum, don't you get to go see the paintings on the wall and you see how fantastic some of these paintings are and you kind of get the idea that you're getting to know the artist a little bit? You see? The work. The work of the craftsman. When you look at Michelangelo's uh, La Piata where Mary is sitting there in that flowing robe holding the Lord Jesus Christ, you ever seen that statue? I was at a funeral one time and we were, uh, I was at a family funeral and at the place where a lot of my family is buried up in Indiana, they have the La Piazza sitting right there in this big place where they put the, uh, the boxes, whatever you call those things. Uh, I don't know what they are, but I don't want to be in one of them. But anyway, <laughs> they slide you in, you know, <laughs> the, the, the crypts, you know. And so they, they've got this La Piazza, and it's a great, it's a great, like, beautiful statue that's a, it's a great reproduction and I'm looking at this and I'm going how could a guy take a piece of Carrera marble and just and turn it into that that's a that takes you know 
I mean, a lot of work. And Michelangelo, I mean, he did all the fine work, and then he'd bring these guys in, and they'd sand and sand and sand and sand and sand and sand, and he'd get in, and, okay, you're fine, that's good. And he'd come in, he'd chip a little more out. I mean, it's amazing how he did this work. And you see, you kind of get to know something about the guy. He was fantastic, wasn't he? When you see God's work, it's fantastic, and you get to see it. The little girl said to Bob Barlow, when he was a little boy, they were, they were classmates, and they were talking about the Bible. And the little girl says, I believe God created the world, but he was very sloppy. And Bob said, what do you mean, sloppy? And, you know, they were talking about making the world, and then she, he, says, he says, well, God wrote the Bible, too. He says, yeah, and he was very sloppy. <laughs> and I, he didn't understand what she was saying, so he says, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, he left his fingerprints all over it. And, you know, he, he got something out of that. That was fascinating to me that he remembered that from being a little kid. That, that, that the little girl, she understood what leaving fingerprints are. They're incriminating, okay? They kind of incriminate you. If mom says, don't get in the chocolate icing and you've got fingerprints all over the place, you know, you're, you're caught, right? So you, you see that God's prints, God's fingerprints, God's, God's creation is to show us those invisible things, he says, that are made. Now notice what he says, even, now here, when he says the word even here, he says this is really, this is the important part of what you're supposed to learn about this passage. Even his eternal power and what? The Godhead. You are to understand and learn and realize the eternal power. Not just of the nuclear fission that takes place in the sun. We have a nuclear generator that just, just gives us life all the time. And yet, it's a created thing. Is it going to last forever? We see in Revelation 22, it's not going to last forever. It's going to get, it's going to get snuffed out like a candle and God's not going to need it anymore. He's going to be the light, okay? So before the sun is ever created... God said, let there be light, and there was light. And, and Noah back there was having a little trouble with this, with Carla, when they were going through the, uh, the lesson, and she's, she's teaching him this in Genesis. And he's, he's asking where the sun is, because she's talking about the light, and Noah's trying to figure out, well, where's the sun at? And she said, well, it hasn't been made yet. And he grabbed a yellow crayon, and he made it real quick. He goes, there it is. <laughs> so he added it. He was having trouble with that. Well, well, you know, most theologians could never have that corrected and, and figured out so quickly. But he himself grabbed that yellow crayon. Just, there it is. I got it in there now. I got to get it. Because he knows that God made the sun. His eternal power to do that is incredible. It's a witness every day. And yet his Godhead is also demonstrated in the creation. So that, and it's done so well, so that they, that who do not believe it, are without excuse. You get that kind of reaffirmed in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. <laughs> so, you get that idea. The word of God is also eternal. Turn over to 1 Peter, chapter 1. The Word of God, the book that you use, is eternal. And I've told you before, over and over and over, that two things you come in contact with in your life that are eternal, and that is, the first one is the Word of God, and the second one are the souls of people. So th there's a ministry between those two. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and look at verse 24. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth what? Forever. And it's from that book that you got saved. He says, for and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. By the good news of the gospel that's preached unto you, it comes from the word of God. Okay, so the word of God is eternal. You know, your friends, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, your friends and your relatives and your associates and your neighbors and all the people that you know, your friends and family are also eternal. Please don't ever forget this. And there are some things that have to be done in your life in order to reach them 
that's going to set you apart from them so that you can reach them. Look at verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, he doesn't say if you want it. He says we have it. He says, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. Now, when you talk to somebody, you're not talking to them. You're not talking to their, to their face. You're not talking to their body. You're not talking to their personality. You're talking to their conscience. The goal in teaching is to reach the conscience. That's the, the touching of the heart. That's the issue. In Acts 2, when it says they were pricked in their hearts, it, it means that they were just like, you know, that's what you ever done that to somebody? If somebody says something, you go, oh, you just <laughs> killed me. That's too much. You can't take it. Uh, you know, Fred Sanford used to do that all the time. And he says, I'm coming to see Elizabeth. You know, <laughs> every time you want to get sympathy. Well, he says here in verse 3, he says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them what? Notice how he says this. He doesn't say who will be lost. He says to them that are lost. They are lost right now. Now you say, well, they might get saved. And if I don't give them the gospel today, maybe they'll, some, somebody else will get them saved. Well, it's possible, yeah. And I can tell you that that, that is, I mean, you, you know, the burden of that so, person's soul is really not on you. The burden is on God because he's the one that, that is doing the work to do this. But if, if, if you walk up and you say, well, I don't feel like doing that to him because I don't feel like talking to them about this with him because I don't like that guy, you know? Well, maybe you should renounce the hidden things of dishonesty and begin to, maybe you should clear that matter up. <laughs> maybe you should apologize <laughs> or maybe you should, uh, you know, kind of reconcile or whatever it is so that you can get that out of the way and so that you don't like him. We're not asking you to like everybody or want to be around everybody, or want to, you know, whatever. What we're looking for you to do is to look past their personality and get to their conscience. That's what raising children is really all about, is getting to their conscience. And their conscience can be, can be dealt with. These people are lost. And besides that, in verse 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. So, You've also got an adversary that's working against you. Lest, he says, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Last week in John 4, we, we spoke strictly on the whole thing. Last week was uh, the woman at the well and uh, the gift that she was being given by the Lord Jesus Christ and how she not only believed it, but she went into town and brought a bunch of people out and they all, these men, believed it. Most of them believed it. And as a result, you see a bunch of Samaritans getting saved even before their time, before it's, a, it's time for them to hear the gospel. He's, he's going through there, so he's going to take care of it. The Seraphonician woman, same thing. She comes trying to get a, a, a healing for her daughter and uh, the Lord, he's just, this is not what he's doing right now. But you know what he does? He senses, he understands, he knows what's the, what the problem is. And what does he do? He reaches right out over the dispensation of the grace of God and gives that woman a kingdom blessing over here in that program. <laughs> he just reaches over us like we're not here. You know why he did that? Because he's God. He can do it. It's okay. He's God. Now, a lot of people read those kind of verses and think, well, why can't he do that today? Oh, he can do it today. It's not a matter of whether he can. It's a matter of whether he will. The program today has to do with your sufferings. And the understanding of how that suffering works in you is something you really got to learn to overcome that issue of suffering. Otherwise, you're going to keep crying about God not giving you the, the, the healing or God not giving you this or God not giving you that. And your life's going to be miserable. This is one of the things that's so hard to reach people with because they, they, they just can't believe that other people are getting this, but they're not. Mr. O'Hare said it best when he said, the last recorded miracle in your Bible took place on the island of Malta with the Apostle Paul, and there's never been another one since recorded in the Bible. And if it's not recorded in the Bible after that, and the program discussing the issue of 
sufferings, Romans 8, and so forth, as you begin to see that starting to now be the new program, I guarantee you, God's not doing it. God is just. He's holy. He's not going to pick people out and say, oh, you, I'm going to let your son come back from the war, but you, 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 no, not you. You don't get your sons back. I mean, does he really think like that? No, of course not. He doesn't let children die of cancer and, 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 and criminals go free. And I mean, that's not what he's doing. He, he's, really, he's really not here today. He's in exile, sitting at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to become his footstool. And the only possible way that God is going to get anything accomplished here today in the dispensation of grace is to work through us, the church, the body of Christ. So the burden's on us, isn't it? The, the whole burden is put on us. Now, we don't do the saving, but Paul makes it so close and he ties it together so well that he says that I may save some. So, well, I don't save anybody. No, but if you didn't give them the gospel, they certainly wouldn't have walked away saved today, right? Somewhere along the line, somebody's got to get saved, and there's usually somebody else involved in that process. I don't think people, you know, all, a lot of people in the world, I mean, I'm sure they do. I'm, I know they do, but they don't all get saved by just picking up the Bible and reading it. They usually get saved uh, through that process, and Paul says, you know, how shall they learn without a teacher? How shall they be sent? You know, and so forth. So the idea of, of the, the preacher going out or the teacher going out and people working with other people, your friends are eternal. They have this, this same burden that you had, only they haven't resolved it yet. So if you're a friend or a family member or a relative or associate, whatever, neighbor, whatever, it, it's upon you to do that. Your service record... Now look at the question mark there. <laughs> I put that on there because uh, people say, well, okay, turn to 1 Corinthians 3. Is the service record eternal? So what's the answer to that? I put the question mark there. What do you think? Is it or is it not? Well, the answer to this is very clear. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says this, he says, um, verse 9, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. That's, the, that's you, the other, the another. He says, But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. That's a warning, by the way. And then he says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if he laid the foundation, can anybody else's foundation be worthy of being built on? No. For other foundation can no man lay, then that is laid. That one that is laid. That which has already been laid. You might want to say it like that. Which is Jesus Christ. He says, now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So this is a judgment. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, notice, he shall suffer loss. Now the gold, silver, and precious stones, they represent something that is eternal. They represent something that cannot burn. He says, but he himself shall be saved, so yet as by fire. It is through this process of judgment that you're going to be saved from something. What is that? Well, first of all, you're going, to be, you're going to be saved from having to carry all this wood, hay, and stubble with you throughout eternity. Eternity. Would you like to do that? Say, this is the jewel that I got for this, and this is the beautiful thing I got for this. And look at And the people say, well, what's that there? Oh, that's wood, hay, and stubble. Remember where Amy Grant used to sing that song, Are You Living in an Old Man's Rubble? That rubble, remember that song? The rubble, where's the rubble? <laughs> well, it's not up there, okay? You know what he does by grace right there? He gets rid of all that, burns it up. So that you don't have to deal with it anymore. However, whatever you have left, which is the gold, silver, and precious stones, will determine eternally how you're going to serve him in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ. 
Now, to me, that's a big consequence. Now, I've had so many people over the years tell me, so I don't care what happens, Russ, I, I just, I'm going to be glad I'm there. Well, yeah, you're going to be glad you're there. Of course you're going to be glad you're there. But you're not going to be glad about this. Go down here and look at uh, verse 17. Uh, verse 16, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So you know, the principle is when you defile the temple of God, God destroys you. Okay. So how does he destroy you there? Well, he doesn't destroy you eternally like he does over there in the book of Revelation where you, you live uh, eternally in the lake of fire, which is really a second death. There's no life to that. That's not life, believe me. But they are conscious. But here he says if any man defile the temple of God, and he's talking about bringing things into it that don't belong in there, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So the idea is that don't, don't, don't get yourself all puffed up about all this religious stuff that you've been doing because some of this might be wood, hay, and stubble and not gold, silver, and precious stones. And, you know, the destruction here isn't eternal destruction that way. It has to do with destroying those things that are going to hinder. And he's not going to have them around him, okay? So just like he wouldn't let Satan live in heaven after he sinned, he kicked him out immediately. And he never even got, he never even got to carry any of those five I wills out. The five I wills of Satan are counteracted by the five I wills of God. Well, Satan says, I will. I'm going to do this, his pride. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And God just cast him out as profane because he was already functioning perfectly without sin in God's program. And then all of a sudden, this iniquity that was in him came up, and man, people always wanted to blame God for this. No, man, that came out of that, that, came out of that creature. The creature had a free will. He could do this. And God didn't even, he didn't wait for him to start doing those things. He just cast him out. You know, it's fascinating to me to see this, that you, you only get one life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to, we don't know how long it is. So the service record, yes, it is eternal. But the part of it that you did the part of you that decided to do what you wanted to do at that time, uh, you can thank God that that's burned up and gone. That's grace. That's God's grace. And so it's yours to live. So the question is, where are you going to go when your body wears out? Oh, guess what? Your body's not eternal. Lost people don't believe that sometimes. Uh, look at Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8. And notice what he says in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also. Notice how he distinguishes us, being new creatures in Christ, from the old creation. Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, he says, but we, but ourselves also, excuse me, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the difference. He says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Why? Waiting for the adoption, that new body, to wit, or to give witness to the redemption of our body. You know... This, this whole concept here, the distinguishing difference between they and us, we and they, is, is always the spiritual difference. So when God comes back for you and you're still walking around doing your thing and whatever that is, wherever, it's, wherever you're at, and he decides he's going to give you a new body, he's not going to ask you if it's okay. He's not going to warn you. He's just going to go blink and you're in it. And you're going to leave whatever you got to leave laying down on the floor, okay? And then you're gone. This is all going to happen rather quickly. Well, that's what you're waiting for, okay? That's the whole idea. 
In other words, because we live in this body of sin, this body of flesh, we have to endure the same thing that even lost people are enduring. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that we learn who we are and we begin to understand that the sufferings are really what? Look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So doesn't that sound like the glory that's going to be revealed in us? Doesn't that sound to you like it's so wonderful and so exciting and we shouldn't even mention them in the same breath with the sufferings? Think about that the next time you have a pity party and want to whine. Oh. Ever ask somebody how they're doing? Well, let's see. (laughs) I got this litany of things, you know? I got all these things wrong with me. And some people just go, (laughs) don't even talk. (laughs) They just say, oh, not too good, you can tell. You know, don't you kind of feel that way in the morning a little bit? I mean, you know, you get up and you start walking around and going, what's wrong with that? (laughs) Why does that hurt when I do that? Or, or, you know, whatever. You you just start kind of giving some, you know, I had some problems one time in my feet. I kept getting out of bed. My feet were hurting so bad. I'm walking on them. I asked my my sister-in-law, I said, what is that? She says, oh, that's, she named off the thing. She says, just take this. It was like a supplement. I took it, went away. I said, wow, that's great. That was, that was really exciting because for months I'm walking around my feet hurting and I couldn't figure out what it was. It starts with a P. It's, it's a really simple thing. But it's a deficiency, okay? It's in your system. You're not getting enough of this and it's causing that, okay? So fix it. And you, you go, there's going to come a day where I'm not going to have to be fixed. There's going to come a day where I'm going to be just just absolutely pain-free and sin-free, too. That's going to be fantastic. This gift, this, what we call eternal life, it is, turn over to chapter 5, it is the gift of righteousness. Look at this in verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, Romans 5, 17, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. That parenthesis that you see at the end of the word there, Christ, you see that parenthesis? That's five verses long, goes all the way back to chapter 5, verse 12, and verse 13 is where the parenthesis starts. And he's going to give you five verses there that explain the gift It culminates in the gift of righteousness. And all we've already studied these before, but the the contrast that you see. You know the woman at the well in John 4, she's looking to get what? Water. And he's asking her for some water, and, and so they have this conversation about water, but it really began to be about spiritual life. That's really what it was. And and if you go back over to go to Revelation 22 again. And I thought this was so interesting because when you look at this, um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, uh, Revelation 22, we were just over there, uh, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. A pure river of what? Not just water, like they're looking for in California, not just H2O. But pure, what? He says, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. You know, you began to see here that life Life has one of the most beautiful metaphors to it that you could ever see. You know what it is? It's water. You can have all the food you want, all the money you want. You can have all all of the the house you want or whatever. But if you've got no water, what are you going to do? What are they going to do in California if this drought doesn't get cleared up? What's going to happen? All those reservoirs, if you notice, they're walking around on the bottoms of them right now. And many of them, and there's fish just laying there, rotten. These things have gone all the way down. And they're cracked mud now. And now they're sucking the water underneath out to live out of those aquifers, which are glacial. 
they're not going to replenish themselves. They're not going to replenish themselves from rain. And so the whole huge area of California is without water, and there, there doesn't seem to be any hope. I mean, they're getting some rain and snow now, but, but not nearly enough to overcome this. Do you know that they already understand that there might be a huge mass exodus from that state? And that includes Nevada, Arizona, a lot of other states. You know, if you don't get rain, what happens? Well, you wait till next year. Well, what happens after five years and you don't get any? Go back and read the story of Elijah when God brought a, a, a very long drought. And they were paying a huge amount of money for a little bitty cup of pigeon dung because they couldn't have it. There wasn't any food. When you don't have water, you got no food. You can't grow food. And 50% of all of our produce comes from California. What do you think that's going to do to our produce prices here in Florida? What do you think it's going to do to us when people come here to Florida where we have all this abundance of water? They better hurry up. If they're going to find some way to make fresh water cheap out of salt water, they better hurry up because, man, I mean, those people out there, there's a lot of people in California. You know, that's the fourth or fifth largest economy on the, in the world out there. And they're running out of water. Gee, can you imagine that? And it's happening on the Great Plains, too. We've been growing so much corn in the Corn Belt that we've, we've tapped all that water out of the ground. It's so far down that it's not even economically feasible to pull it all up. It's so far down now. And it's glacial. It's coming down through the aquifers from the northern part of the world. And, and they, they, they're not going to replenish that in it took thousands of years to fill those things up. Water itself is a demonstration of what? Life. It's beautiful. And it cleans you and it, and it gives you, you know, sustenance. And, and it's, it's something that you see here. It's going to be in the New Jerusalem. And it's not going to be, there won't be any bill attached to it every month. It won't be muddy, mucky water. Right? It won't be Colorado mine water. It's going to be pure, crystal clear water. It's eternal. Okay? Think about that. When you think about eternal life, think about all the other things that are eternal. It will help you. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your son that gives us the free gift of God, the, the, the gift of eternal life. We thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.